Good afternoon, colleagues. A very warm welcome to our learning leading, uh, leading learning uh, seminar for today. This is the latest event in a series of events to mark UHI's uh, official 10th birthday celebrations. Uh, my name is Keith Smythe. I am Professor of Pedagogy or Learning and Teaching, if you like, uh, and Head of the Learning and Teaching Academy here at the University of the Highlands and Islands. Uh, we're thrilled to welcome a number of participants and colleagues from across and beyond UHI to today's seminar. And before we commence, uh, let me just share with you a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, so you will have been told in advance, but this session is being recorded, uh, so it can be revisited and other colleagues can watch it um, as and when they would like to. Um, our, our kind of audience for today, you will find that your cameras are all, all turned off, um, but please, please feel free to interact with us and with the panel and post any questions you might have in the Q&A uh, feature, which you will find uh, in the webinar space. Uh, we will be checking that Q&A feature uh, throughout the session uh, and pausing at various points to take your questions and put them to the panel. The focus for today, our Leading Learning Seminar, is to explore um, the impact um, of the last sort of 14 months in particular, as we've been experiencing um, the challenge of the pandemic. Uh, we will be looking at the nature of learning and teaching, uh, and how it's needed to change and the impact on learning and teaching within the sector across the last year or so. Uh, and we will also be looking towards the future uh, and asking ourselves what needs to change, what have we learned from COVID-19 and the move to online learning and teaching, and what are the implications of that moving forward for how we might reimagine or reposition our learning and teaching provision, both within the sector uh, and here within the University of the Highlands and Islands. I'm very pleased that we've got uh, an excellent panel of speakers uh, here with us today. Um, uh, in the order that we'll hear from them, we have Professor Alison Littlejohn, Director of the UCL Knowledge Lab, uh, University College London, Professor Frank Rennie, uh, Professor of Sustainable and Rural Development at Lewis Castle College, UHI. Uh, we have Anna Wendy Stevenson, Programme Leader for the BA ONS Applied Music. Uh, and we're very pleased that joining us from Germany, we have Amelia Marienfeld, a second year student on the aforementioned programme. So the format for today, um, we will invite each of our speakers in turn to give a short provocation. Um, uh, and they've all been asked to address slightly different aspects um, of the, the challenges of COVID in terms of learning and teaching uh, and the, the, some of the key implications of it. And once we've heard from each of our speakers, we will then move into uh, a more open panel discussion where we'll explore some of the issues that have been raised in the provocations uh, and we'll be taking the questions from the Q&A feature um, and bringing those into the discussion uh, and using those to help us frame uh, hopefully a lively discussion that we will have over the next 40, 45 minutes or so. So without any uh, further uh, delay from me, um, I will first invite the panel members just to briefly introduce themselves and then we will get into our opening provocations. So, um, Alison, could I please ask you to invite yourself first? Oh, hi, I'm Alison Littlejohn. I'm a professor at University College London, a director of the UCL Knowledge Lab, which is uh, one of the world's leading research centres in the future of education with technology. And I'm absolutely delighted to be with you at this event to celebrate 10 years of the UHI because I began my career in North Highland College. Great, thank you very much, Alison. And uh, welcome home, welcome home, welcome back. Um, Frank, if we could move to you, please introduce yourself. Yes, good afternoon, colleagues. Um, I'm Frank Rennie, Professor of Sustainable Rural Development at UHI, based at Lewis Castle College. I'm a natural scientist by by training and by inclination, um, but I spend much of the last two three decades working on uh, online education and digital learning, whatnot, as we'll as we'll explore today. So delighted to be with you today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. Uh, Anna Wendy, if we could invite you to say hello, please. Hello, everyone. I'm Anna Wendy Stevenson. I'm a musician. I'm a program leader for the BA Applied Music with the University of the Highlands and Islands. I'm based out in the Outer Hebrides, and that's from that's my base. And from there, I lead this flagship innovative uh, program, which uh, I guess really um, 
tests the some of the uh, purpose, I guess, of uh, the University of the Highlands and Islands. Thank you very much, Anna Wendy. Uh, and last but certainly not least, uh, Amelia, if we could uh, hear from you, please. Hello, I'm Amelia Marienfeld, a second year student with the BA Applied Music course. Um, and I've been fortunate enough to also live in the Outer Hebrides where Anna Wendy stays as well for the last time. Now that COVID has struck, I've been here in Germany, but I've been lucky enough to be able to continue studying with UHI. And I'm really looking forward to the next year and what, um, what the next year and the semester is going to happen. Great, thank you very much, Amelia, and it's great to have you with us. Uh, so, colleagues, um, uh, participants, we will now move into the opening provocations. Um, uh, we've asked each speaker to give us uh, their perspective on what they've been asked to talk about for around about five minutes or so, uh, and then we'll move into some open discussion. Uh, I will trust the speakers to keep their own time, um, but if you do go excessively over or seem to be in danger of that, I will have to intervene. Um, so. Uh, if we can move on from there, and we will invite Alison to give the first opening provocation, please. Over to you, Alison. I, I think you're on mute. Yeah. That's it. No, you're back. Thank you. I noticed in, in the video um, that we started at 1991. Uh, and in fact, that's when I was working in North Highland College, which is here in the, in the slide. And so 30 years ago, while working as a chemistry lecturer in North Highland Co College, we started to experiment with digital technologies for teaching. And I, my provocation is, have we learned from the lessons that, that from the past? So 30 years ago, fishing industry was in decline. A lot of my students had come to college to reskill, and I realized there was a number of ways that we could support them. So the first was flexible learning so that the students, um, some travelled long distances, had family or work commitments, so technology can allow flexibility and where and when they study. And we often focus on that, but also there's a connecting the students, not only um, with each other, but with experts around the world as well. And the third thing is active learning. So some students hadn't studied for a long time. There were concepts that were difficult for them to learn. The thing is the technology allows people to shift from lecturing to supporting students to learn through experimentation. But at the same time, all this learning has to contribute to the economic growth, not just of the Highlands and of Scotland and the UK, uh, but around the world as well. And it enables people to live and thrive in employment in the Highlands and, uh, as Amelia will show, elsewhere as well. A few weeks ago, I was contacted by a former student from the early 90s when we were doing these experiments, he told me he'd lost his job in a fishing boat. And there was a course that we developed that helped him retrain as a plant operator in Dunry. He did a successful career leading to management. So what we do helps students to change their lives and we have to design the teaching around, but have we really learned those lessons? We need to start from the perspective of the student. And, uh, and also think about how that connects with the economic situation that we're in. So at the time in 1991, University of Highlands and Islands was a twinkle in Graham Hill's eye. And since then, the seemingly impossible dream has come true and you should feel proud of that. But my provocation is there's a need to go much further in linking UHI directly to the economic and social development of Scotland, the UK, and further afield, particularly in the post-COVID era. So that brings me around to COVID. Um, over the past year, um, education, higher education in particular, has changed in ways that we could never have imagined. As we moved into lockdown, campuses closed, teaching pivoted online. Much of UHI teaching has been online, but not all of it. And all universities have changed quickly, intended to transfer the teaching on campus, lectures and tutorials online, rather than necessarily thinking about these lessons from the past and defining, uh, designing effective online learning. So this change has been termed emergency online teaching. How do we move beyond that? So in March 2020, I launched a study of how colleagues at University College London have adapted to moving online. 
uh, and working from home, we asked colleagues to upload a picture representing how they felt and to write a narrative of their experiences. With over 400 responses, some of these will resonate with UHI, although the context is very different. So one of the key things that we found was there were diverse experiences. Some people have loved what's happened over the past year. Other people have hated it. Most people have felt a whole range of different feelings at the same time that can be a little bit confusing. The second thing is that we found that some of the systemic practices, the way that we teach on campus has tended to dominate how people have moved online. So we need to really think about what is it about the online that can help students learn the third finding is that people have felt a little bit of isolation and disconnection. So how do we enable people to use technologies, not just by giving them this technology, but also to develop and engender this culture of connecting, even though we're um, at a distance. And the other thing, very worryingly, structural inequalities have deepened over the last year with uh, for example, women taking on much more of the burden of care for children, partners, elderly, people at home, and students as well. So, what can we do in terms of moving beyond this? We need to start from the perspective of the student, but at the same time, we really need to focus on some of the social and economic um, challenges that there are as well. Here are some examples of what we're doing in the UCL Knowledge Lab. So on the left hand side is um, a course that we've just launched with the Open University, which is on antimicrobial resistance. And this is trying to help um, the other health global challenges that we have. We don't only have COVID, but we have this idea of um, microbes becoming resistant to antibiotics. So we're looking at new ways to help professionals to learn how to use antibiotics in different ways. And on the right hand side, my colleagues um, Diana Lorillard and Eileen Kennedy are working with colleagues in Lebanon and the Relief Centre to look at how people who are migrating and in transition, how they can learn. So there's lots of ways that we can really connect what we do with um, some of the economic situations that people are in. UHI is in a unique position to work with people across the Highlands to support how they learn. You can have a, a bigger economic impact in helping Scotland recover from the current challenges of COVID and Brexit. You can have a big social impact across the Highlands and beyond, taking Scotland's culture, heritage and brilliance to places around the world and bringing together the needs of individual students with national and international priorities. This would place UHI in a unique position. In my view, UHI is, um, is a national treasure, a bit like the Open University, but how do we do what you do better? That is my provocation. Thank you very much indeed, Alison. Um, uh, a thought provoking uh, and rich start to um, the formal part of our, our session for today. Um, and a number of questions you've, you've left us with, which we will make sure we come back to. Um, and it might be a nice way to, to approach how we conclude the session. Uh, and thinking also about some of the things you said around diverse experiences and also structural inequalities. And it's certainly making me think about a couple of uh, major factors um, that are students and staff when we went into COVID. Even at a university like UHI, which uses a lot of technology, um, you know, they, they didn't self-select to study or to teach fully online. Uh, and in terms of those inequalities, I think, um, uh, and we might return to this, uh, certainly we need to be mindful of those that are space rich and sp space poor in the home environment, uh, and also those that are technology rich and technology poor. Um, so lots, lots that could ping off what you've just introduced there. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, we'll now move to our second provocation and we'll invite Frank to uh, step up to the, the virtual stage, please, Frank. Thanks, Keith. Um, well, I mean, I've known Alison for a while, but we, we didn't rehearse this, but it probably is not surprising that I've got several common strands that I'd pick up from there. Um, my provocation is, are we ahead of the curve? Um, in moving through this pandemic, for me, because I teach mainly online, it's been business as usual. It's hardly been a blip. The only difference for me is I don't 
drive to the store and only half an hour away to sit at a computer and do this, what I can do at home. So it's it, it's been very simple for me and very, very um, all embracing just to do it from here. But I know that many colleagues um, have had different experiences, as, as Alison was saying. It's, you know, we, we, are, we don't have one size fits all at UHI. We have face to face courses only. We have online courses only, but we have a huge mixture in between. So it's how these things all link together. Um, one thing I don't like is the idea of, of the terminology of, of virtual learning and virtual students. To me, these are real students and this is real learning. So let's stop calling it virtual. Let's call it something different, but it's not virtual. It is real. It is, it, 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 it's a real benefit to people. The strength of the UHI and the reason I got involved um, in 1990, um, so that's a long time in terms of the, the gestation of that. The first courses that we're teaching online were in the, in the early 90s, 93, 94, using a, a thing called COSI, um, a conferencing system in, based on Rurtel that came from the University of Guelph. Um, but the reason I got involved from a rural development perspective was taking education to people rather than removing people from rural areas to force them into a city just because that was where we happened to offer the educational courses. One of the things that I think we can do better in this next um, phase as we as we come out of lockdown into, into some uh, resemblance of, of, of uh, normality, you know, the campus phase training, etc., is to provide better training for staff and students, how to actually mix with these things, how to mix these things together. Many, many staff were doing this. Some staff, as you said, Keith, were thrown at the deep end and say all of a sudden they couldn't actually use their traditional face-to-face uh, -face methods and they had to learn very, very quickly. And there's been a huge adaptation in that. We learned very, very early on that the students in the online environment perform better when we give them an induction at the start, when we built in how to do this and give them a confidence boost, check their passwords worked and so on and so forth. But it was about that induction at the start. One of the things that's thrown to high relief in this pandemic is the political imperative to have good bandwidth, whatever you are, whether you're in a rural area or in a city area. And I, I find quite often that it's areas out with the UHI areas that are lacking because there's been a huge improvement in the Highlands and Islands over the last decade in terms of the, the quality of access of it for all online. But I think we need to reinvent ourselves. We need to stay ahead of the curve. Many other institutions are now delivering in an online format. But UHI is neither the open university where everything is at a distance, nor is it a red brick where everything is on campus. And we have to find that mix, that unique blend that we have that differentiates and presents a UHI identity that allows people to participate in the Highlands and Islands, wherever they are. And the various 110 or so inhabited islands and, and rural communities, crofting villages, and so on and so forth. I think we need to do things like uh, we'll, we'll hear from Anna Wendy in, in a minute about the network music. And you know, the rural development became as a, a, as a as a technique that people could upskill themselves from within rural areas without leaving the rural areas, without without leaving their families and, 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 and children and so on. But we have to take it to the next stage. We have to use the technology and the skills that we have in the UHI to outreach in the community. We need to develop new curriculum. We need to develop ways of actually being able to use and operate equipment at different locations, like by remote use, for example. Um, we need to embed research students in the community so they're not living in the so-called ivory tower. They're living in the real world and seeing real benefits of what they do and they're delivering that from a distributed platform across the Highlands and Islands, which makes real value. And we get back to rearticulating the values that we have about being a university of the region, for the region, in the region. So are we ahead of the curve? I think we are ahead of the curve, but we have to stay ahead of the curve and we have to be different in a way that allows us to articulate those values, that allows us to articulate the strengths of the natural environment, the richness of the culture, the, the ability to contrast heritage and history and place that actually bring you something valuable that, that can reach out beyond the Highlands and Islands to educate people in other parts of the world, but with a distinctive blast of the Highlands and Islands, a taste of the Highlands and Islands that gives you that sensation that you're not just anywhere, you're in the University of the Highlands and Islands. And we can participate through online libraries, through drop-in meetings, through a whole variety of technology that allows us to combine meeting people face-to-face -face 
with meeting um, in, in the online environment. I think it's really sad that it's taken a pandemic. I'm, I'm all in favour of different forms of encouraging inclusivity, whether it's gender inclusiveness, racial inclusiveness, and a whole variety of, of, of other attributes. It's sad that it's taken a pandemic to bring to the forefront the idea of embracing geographical inclusivity. And I think that's what the UHI can contribute in terms of its delivery of education at higher level. Happy to ask Thank any you. questions. I haven't got any slides. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Frank. And for those that may not have seen it, um, uh, uh, Jill did post uh, just a little reminder. Feel free to use the question uh, and answer feature and we will pick up the questions uh, that emerge there. And I see that Rosemary's kicked us off, so thank you very much, Rosemary. So um, we'll, we'll move into tackling some of these questions after the provocations. A lot in what you've said there, Frank, um, and, and you know, uh, we're talking about learning and, and the pandemic, but of course, it puts a lens on a range of things that we do um, and the importance of UHI, given our nature, being strong in our local communities and in the region, uh, but also having that kind of wider outreach. And I think that raises some really important considerations particularly for us in, as an institution, but for other universities post COVID, of um, what does the university now look like as a geographically and digitally distributed space? Um, and what does the curriculum look like? Uh, a curriculum that can be accessed um, lots of different ways from uh, geographically and digitally dispersed perspectives. So things I'm sure we'll come back to there. Um, for now, we'll move on to our final provocation uh, and we'll hear from Anna Wendy and Amelia. And I think, Anna Wendy, you're going to kick off, I believe. I am. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So, my provocation is that the pandemic is an opportunity to consider how we can design curriculum, which can nurture and create a sense of community in online environments. When the pandemic hit in March last year, one of our graduates of applied music set a mini Twitter storm as I'm a few, sure a few others did with a, a, an emoji of dark glasses and something to the effect of applied music has got this. And, and it's true, uh, when we designed applied music in uh, 2012, it was a flagship degree delivering practical music inclusive of all genres and it attracted a wide demographic. And we delivered it to, and have done using blended learning online and residencies and our curriculum design was from the outset to some extent COVID resilient. We had module titles such as remote digital music collaboration alongside music in education and community context. And this made clear at the diversity of skills and locus for education delivery. Uh, students would come together for four times per academic year at different locations to make music together, to collaborate, perform and socialise in professional venues such as Anne Lanter in Stornoway or Mareel in Shetland. And we designed these residencies deliberately so that they're kind of responsive to opportunities to engage with industry, the creative communities and uh, professional bodies. And there's often like a very much a festival um, like quality to them. And in order to uh, address accessibility and to facilitate deeper development of learning with regard to kind of technological skills, in 2014, this is especially for you, Frank, we developed the virtual residency and absolutely completely agree uh, there's nothing virtual about the residency. Um, it's learning, it's collaboration and creativity that is happening. It's just happening in an online uh, environment. We did actually feel uncomfortable at this term and changed it to the networked virtual residency. But um, at the time, it was absolutely in 2014, it was kind of groundbreaking this idea that we weren't all going to be together, but we were going to main, um, re remain in our areas um, across Scotland and then collaborate online in real time. But now the rest of the world is caught up and there's a shared understanding um, about um, globally really that virtual doesn't mean real. I think everyone knows that it, it, it that virtual still can be real. So we called it the networked virtual residency. Um, 
But uh, since the outset, we injected international dimensions to our virtual residencies, uh, collaborating online with other university music programs in real time with Australia. That was interesting. We saw some pajamas. And Sweden and Senegal is now actually uh, the collaboration with Senegal is now the focus of some research. So we've been um, leading learning in, in this way and um, we've had consecutive 100% in the National Student Survey. Um, and one of the key aspects that I believe which has helped us manage COVID and what I believe works well within this distributed network program is the focus on developing a scent, sense of student community. So uh, we make the conscious effort to creating an in-course sense of community, a sense of belonging. Um, and our students are committed to their local communities and to their professional music communities. But this in-course sense of belonging is really crucial, I think, um, to the collaborative world of, of musicians. But particularly, I think it saw us through the time of COVID, and we could talk about that a little bit with Amelia. Um, and the social aspect is also key as well to this, um, as well as networking as a group within the wider professional world. So the social and the industry networking usually took place face to face at residencies. But this year we've had to extend ourselves further and move our residencies online, engaging with external stakeholders such as like Expo North, Score Draw Music, Scottish Music Industry Association, and um, connect our student community to the industry online. Um, and we've had projects which, which we've done such as uh, where we've engaged our students as researchers to collaborate online and to create and record a song for a commission by from Community Land Scotland. And um, so, uh, you know, we're also having that uh, captured in a professionally commissioned documentary. And all of this collaboration has been happening online. So I really see COVID as a chance for us all to reevaluate the university curriculum and consider how this curriculum matches with the core values of our university, which I think is chimes with what Frank was saying there, um, whilst putting the students at the centre. Um, and I've got my own framework of C words, uh, which kind of inform one another when thinking of curriculum design, because the nature of leading something like applied music means that I, we are as a team and I'm leading the continued um, redevelopment every year. We don't do the same thing. We have to make every residency fresh and responsive. And I think that's a key aspect and you can do it online. So when designing and supporting curriculum, my C words, um, whether it's designing for residencies, activities, um, they inform the process and I feel that they're inextricably linked. So creativity, thinking about community, connectivity, collaboration, communication and change in our culture. Um, so I think it would be nice to ask Amelia um, on your thoughts, Amelia, how you felt in your programme you were, uh, you know, prepared for COVID. So I can honestly say I spent the first year doing everything normal, as you would say normal, and then in second year it just went all over into being online. And I felt that UHI, but especially uh, the BA Applied Music was very prepared. All the material was online um, anyway. We as students already knew how to use the platform, so we didn't need a long transition period on how we get used to, to all the materials and how we can connect uh, with other students online. And there was just a built-in resilience from the course that really benefited us as students to um, feel like everything was, was still going and we still felt a huge community. And uh, Amelia, that community, you know, what opportunities did you, did you have to, through your course to help you stay connected? Well, talking about community, one of the things I think was that, that the staff really put a lot of work in putting extra staff on for us students to stay connected, whether that was um, informal sessions that we could have, such as the Desert Island, this that was um, 
contributed by the staff, but just, you know, working through other, other modules, we were working in groups. You mentioned the remote digital collaboration module where literally the base of what we do is collaborating with others online and also the virtual residencies. There were tasks that required connectivity throughout the whole year, not only through the week. So you stayed connected anyway. And there was other stuff like there was a, a space online where we as students could find new opportunities to get involved in, which then helped. It was verified by lectures as well. So, so you felt it was a good opportunity for yourself and you felt connected to other students and also to, to the world after university. Thank you, Amelia. Thank you, Anna, Wendy and Amelia very much indeed. Again, so much to think about there. Um, uh, really like the focus on values around community, culture, collaboration, change, communication. Um, and also, I think the, you know, the BA applied music, many, many of us know about it. Other colleagues might be hearing about it for the 1st time today. Um, but that's been a real kind of exemplar within UHI of how to. Um, creatively approach. Establishing kind of, you know, the communities of learning within our programs um, that allow students to, to come together and to engage um, regardless of where they're located. And I think a really good example of um, uh, how we can intersect our digital, digital and physical spaces and locations uh, in terms of distributed learning. Uh, and I also think a really good example, one of the things that came out of COVID was we suddenly got rid of a lot of those assumptions about you can't teach this subject online uh, because we had to, but you were already teaching it. And, and, and teaching a really creative subject uh, in a networked way already, which I think um, is really interesting. And I'm also conscious that because of what you've done, the students in the program were well placed when COVID did hit. And I'm conscious that in other universities, uh, when we went, we had to move online, students had to self organize in digital spaces because our own institutional digital spaces, for example, the virtual learning environment, as good as it can be, they don't allow students to self-organize because we organize students based on matriculation codes and modules. Uh, so when COVID hit, they had to organize themselves in their own spaces. So I think there's so many lessons to be learned there. Um, we're now going to move into opening up the discussion. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Rosemary and Rachel, for our first questions for the panel. Um, just before we move into those, I will invite um, the panel members to offer any immediate thoughts or responses they would like to in relation to what their fellow panel members have raised in the provocation. Um, so just any general observations that are coming out of what we've just heard, and then we'll move into the audience questions. Um, Alison, we started with you, so I wonder if we can come back to you for any any initial observations from what you've heard from the uh, other panel members. Yeah, thank you, Keith. Um, I thought there was an incredible resonance across the, the, the different perspectives that, that we offered um, in that there, you know, there was a theme about communities and, and technologies and how we bring those together. So how how are student communities enabled and you know what what are their priorities? I thought that that was a really important theme. And also the the Scottishness of UHI. Um, I tend to think of UHI, of course, it's, it's very Scottish and it's about the Highlands, but it's about much more than that, I think. It's about what the Highlands offers the world, including the rest of Scotland, the UK, Europe, and, you know, it's, it's a bit like um, an onion. And for, for me, it's how do we connect those in a way that, um, that really enables the, the benefits of, of UHI to be exploited is the wrong words but but enabled to for, for the benefit of of everyone so so for example the, the example i used in my own presentation was of a, a student who managed to switch careers and had a successful career in the highlands and and didn't move away for example uh, but equally you know there's so much rich research going on and um in in many ways uh, Scotland and the Highlands in particular has so much expertise in, in very niche areas. So how do we enable that to be um, to be strengthened and scaled up? Thank you very, very much indeed, Alison. And I think um, uh, on that final point, I think that raises a really interesting question 
uh, around, uh, and it's something our colleague uh, Gary Campbell, one of our vice principals, talks about quite often. How can we harness the Highlands and Islands region um, and the way in which UHI structured itself as our own natural laboratory for research? And I think post COVID, I think there's a, a, a real opportunity for us to look at capturing lessons learned, you know, uh, from approaching learning and teaching during COVID in a networked university to share for the sector. And it's something that we've we've talked about with uh, Lydia Romer, who I see is with us today as well. So lots for us to think about there. Frank, um, would you like to offer any observations based on the provocations? I'm just surprised how much of a similarity there are with the different perspectives that are coming through there. I think that, you know, the, the strength that we have is the realisation, you know, and staying ahead of the curve isn't just about technology. Other places have technology as well. It's about the culture, the mindset of actually moving into that online environment. Um, and I think the key to that is the design process. It, it, you design it for what you want out of it as it, go, as it goes through. Uh, and I think we need to take that out with the doors of the university and out there. There's a whole discussion now, I guess, what is the purpose of the campus? And, you know, in, in, in the longer bit, we have more space than we, than we need in many places. I would like to see if you're studying wading birds, then a better place for that is in the Machers of Uist. Let's have the Ornithological Centre on the Macher or, or, or St Kilda, that sort of stuff. If you're looking at archaeology, you want to get out into these into those communities and, and, and go into the brock and go into these things and see that, see that, get your hands dirty and see these things. You don't want to do it from a library in, or, a, or, a, or a, a lab in the city. So we have those trends that we can build upon and it's about how we can use that technology to actually cascade that into the community and how to actually link these things together that bring together not just the research that's taken place within the university, but actually inviting people to come into our door. One of the things that really impresses me about the pandemic is the is the embracing of the collegial um, deliveries where people are actually offering their talks and their webinars and their discussions online. And I can actually sit and listen to a talk on history or a talk on archaeology, whereas previously I didn't even know what was happening. I, I, it didn't even they, they did it within their own little silo or their own department or their own university. And you can you can join people in Ireland or Maine or you know whatever it is. Let's actually reap the benefit of that and don't throw that away when we when we actually go back into to, to campus-based mentality. Let's use that technology and take it to the next stage. Thank you very much indeed, Frank, and we will come back to that very issue of um, uh, what are the lessons learned? Um, how do we harness um, the good things that have happened during uh, very challenging times? Uh, and I, I think, you know, the kind of notion as well as a university, because of what we are and who we are, much of our curricula is linked to the culture, geography, history, um, language you know, uh, of the region. Um, but the idea of using technology to go even further and connecting others elsewhere into into that culture and history um, uh, and so forth. I think you know something really exciting to be explored there um, as we kind of look towards how we harness the digital even more effectively going forward. Anna Wendy, uh, we'll turn to yourself and then Amelia for any thoughts based on what you've heard from your fellow panel members. Very interesting. Thank you, Keith. Uh, very interesting. I I remember when UHI first came into being. And I was uh, asked to write something for a staff spotlight, and I I was asked about my opinion on on the technology, and I remember thinking about this, and because of where I am located um, in the Outer Hebrides, which is of a place of great cultural interest and linguistic interest, um, I was very much rooted in a kind of face to face environment, and um, so. I, th I thought about it and I thought about Thomas Telford's roads and bridges in the 1800s and how those roads and bridges opened up the region. Um, but they, you know, roads and bridges and infrastructures create traffic and traffic go places and they come away from places too. And I think that's where that was something that I was very, very conscious of. And, um, that I realized that, you know, actually the technology, it's how you use the technology, therefore, it, how important it is, as Frank said, to also 
um, place research within these communities, bring people um, and have them have the, the research taking place within these communities. But also that the technology is such an opportunity again to um, harness the best of it. And we've been doing that. I think we've been having online Kayleys for beamed out from the Hebrides that have attracted thousands of people across the world. And, you know, we've got a, a huge market with our culture and I don't like the word market too much. I don't like monetizing everything, you know, but, uh, but we do have an audience. Let's say, um, we have a wonderful audience in our diaspora and, and it's not even just the diaspora that have kind of cultural her uh, heritage, but, you know, it's, um, in, in today's world, we have the opportunity. Um, to appreciate in and of itself, the value of just looking and exploring, um, other cultures and being able to, um, establish and what we have in common as well as what separates us. And, and that's one of the things is another of our kind of mantras within our program is, you know, we're all coming from dis different areas within the Highlands and Islands. And let's not forget that that's a, a, an incredibly diverse place in itself. You know, the Highlands and Islands, we've got a lot of diversity culturally, musically um, within this region. And um, so what feels very important in the kind of um, the opportunity that technology provides us is to be able to explore what we also have in common, but yes, I very much liked um, also um, the discussion, Alison, about uh, the student centre um, approach and the fact that we've got so much um, untapped, really. You know, there's a there's a lot. Uh, the future, I believe, uh, is is bright. Thank you very much, Anna Wendy, and I think. Um... Yeah, again, so much to think about uh, an idea of um, the kind of virtual Kaylee attracting thousands of people around the world, I think poses a question for us and other institutions around how can we harness technology um, to provide more open opportunities to engage in learning and teaching um, and, and kind of social development uh, and social events. Um, it doesn't just have to be about the formal curricula and those that are formally enrolled on it. And we can use technology to do events like this that, that anyone can participate in. So thank you. Um, Amelia, would you like to offer any thoughts based on what you've heard? And then we're going to move in and tackle some of the questions in the chat area. Yeah, so um, what I really liked and, and thought about was the fact that instead of taking people or students from rural areas into cities, it's keeping them at their, their home places and being able to study from home. And I think that's a huge benefit from you at Shai, which I personally don't don't see in Germany at all. And it's something I think people should look closer into. You know, we have the technology and um, I know a lot of people who, who study in the city and due to COVID, they had to move home. And they actually, when they moved home, they, they realized how lovely and how good their home is and that they actually miss home. And having you at Shai and the technology, you can actually stay home and stay in these rural places and still be able to be connected to a lot of people around the world um, in your degree. Um, but also you make you can also attract other people to these beautiful rural areas, which I really think is a huge benefit. Um, and I think UHI should really work on that and, and continue doing that because it's it's a lovely project and idea. And I think a lot of people can look on that and, and take ideas and maybe do that for themselves. Thank you, Amelia. And I think you've made a really, really important point there and among several um, about the potential for technology and digital spaces to democratize access to learning, um, uh, both informally and formally, uh, and to bring education to people uh, where they are and where they want to be without disrupting any of that. So I think that's uh, critically important. OK, colleagues, we are now going to um, tackle some of the questions in the Q&A area. Um, Frank has responded to a couple of these already, so thank you very much, Frank. Um, what I think we'll do, um, just in interest of time and to be as uh, equal as possible, um, we will take um, the first question that hasn't been answered in any way, uh, and that's also from Rosemary. Uh, how can we as a university ensure a partnership collaboration alongside innovation and engagement across the education sector 
locally, rurally, and internationally. So aspects of this we've touched upon already, um, and uh, my fellow panel members can see the um, questions in the Q&A area as well. Um, I wonder, Anna Wendy, I might turn to you for maybe a brief response to this, and then we'll hear from Alison as well, who touched upon these very issues in her opening provocation. So, Anna Wendy, would you like to offer a perspective on this question? Okay, I've just been talking about applied music, so I've got my applied music networking head on, and um, I um, I think that that developing the relationships with industry partners at a program at program levels are very important um, in order to establish curriculum that is. Uh, going to be um, applicable at a local uh, level and across the national and international level. I don't know quite sure if I'm answering anyone can jump in and uh, add their thoughts. Um, I think that's really important though. I think that the, uh, the whole notion of the curricula and how we conceptualize it and who it's for uh, and actually, I think if we if we are to achieve um, these aspirations or further achieve them, because we've got lots of good work, you know, already that we can evidence around how we engage, you know, with industry, um, uh, how we support innovation. But I think there probably is a real need in amongst this going forward to make sure and sense check, and 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 be confident that our curricula and the way in which we approach learning and teaching does serve needs in terms of what our students are studying. What employers need, um, the development yes. of creative skills and employability skills, uh, you know, um, uh, graduate attributes that are grounded, as I believe ours are, in in the wider skill sets and literacies that our students will need when they they go beyond the university. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the curriculum issues are really important in that that respect. Um, Alison, this is very much something you spoke about. Um, I wonder if you um, might want to give a, a perspective here and and in some ways answer. What was kind of one of your own questions as well? Yes, it's easy to ask the questions. It's not it's, it's not so easy to have the great answers. But I think partnership is at, at the heart of going forward. You know, post pandemic, I think all universities have a uh, an obligation, uh, especially the universities that are funded by public money, have an obligation to try to help the local national and, and global communities to, to solve some of the problems that have come up um, and partnership helps um, eliminate it helps to increase the the porosity of the university i think frank was the one who mentioned the ivory tower uh, so it's getting beyond that making sure that universities are are open and so working with people beyond the bounds of the university is is one way of doing that and, and that would be students of course but um, organizations however i do think that we have to do it in a very cautious way we have to be very clear about what are the issues that we're trying to solve what are these problems sometimes i think we've, we've we haven't really got to the bottom of some of these problems and what it is that we're trying to define and this is why i honestly think uhi should be working very um very much in partnership with the scottish government for example trying to think about what are the issues that the Highlands face, um, which per perhaps other parts of Scotland don't face? Um, or what is it in other parts of Scotland the Highlands can, can offer or other parts of the world that the Highlands can, can offer support? And, and so people can be located wherever they want, um, but, but work towards these um, solving these problems. I think it's important to choose partners carefully, and I've learned that very much um, particularly my work in the, U, the uh, UCL Knowledge Lab, we work with entrepreneurs from all around the world. Uh, some, sometimes there's a different motivation behind what we want to do. And we're very aware of the fact that, you know, there are a lot of companies out there who really want to help solve the world problems. They're not just about making money. Uh, but on the other hand, that you know, m money can also be a motivation. So when public and private sector organisations have these different motivations, we, we have to be aware of them and make ways around them. One of the ways that that has been made most visible is around datafication, 
how tech companies, for example, use data, monetize it, and so on. Um, of course, this can be done in, in an ethical way to support and to help solve some of the world's biggest problems. I mean, we've all relied on uh, technologies, especially since the pandemic. So um, I don't think I'm answering the questions, but I'm just sort of unpacking this very complex picture, which which really needs to be to be looked at. And I think UHI is in a very unique position where you can do things in a way that other universities certainly couldn't. Thank you very much, Alison. And I think you've um, uh, answered and also unpacked some of those issues uh, in uh, a really useful level of detail. And I think um, also coming off the back of that, you know, there are kind of further questions to ask ourselves, I think, going forward in this respect. Um, Rachel kindly posted a question which, which Frank has tackled. So I think, um, again, just in the interest of um, covering as much as we can, uh, I'll go to the next question that hasn't had a verbal or written response in any way thus far. So uh, I'm going to move to Lydia's question. Thank you very much, Lydia. Um, and Frank, I'm going to ask you to respond to this one and then Amelia uh, to come in with a student view, if you wouldn't mind uh, having a look at uh, Lydia's question there. Um, so um, I'm sure we can all see this, but just in case not, uh, Lydia's uh, posed the question, place remains hugely important in the future of learning. And we've got some great examples within the session already. Uh, but how could UHI use digital learning to deliver an equivalent learning experience to all UHI students, a respective place and a respective of mode of attendance? Um, and there's a kind of follow up there. What function should our campuses play in, uh, in future for students and staff against a reimagined model of learning and teaching? Um, uh, if it's OK, I think I'll suggest, Frank, we take the first part of that question uh, to begin with. Um, so can I pass to you, please? Thanks, Keith. Um... I would develop some of the things that, that, that Alison began talking about in her in her response there. I mean, there's hardly there's hardly a month goes past where I don't get emails from people um, who want to come and work at the UHI, who want to move to the Highlands and Islands. Um, quite often, they're academics in other areas. Quite often, they are people from the, the Highlands and Islands who are who are working in other parts of the country or the world, and they want to go back. Part of the mission of UHI is actually building the the community and the the economy the structure the intellectual capital of the community that we're looking at and whether it's online or whether it's on the campus base you know there's a real role for the UHI's network to actually come in behind that and 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 make make a different make a distinctive difference from what I, I i was working as a as a postgraduate student in Aberdeen University nearly 40 years ago and the outreach um you know the 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 department there were providing lectures and talks and whatnot throughout, throughout the Highlands and Islands. Um, now we have a, a way of delivering that really literally to your home. And one of the one of the you know the strengths of that is if we actually as a, as a university can extend the reach of learned societies beyond the cities into people's homes, then you're actually providing that intellectual food that, that capital that people can actually consume. Um, you know, I've been a fellow of the of the, the Geological Society of Edinburgh for nearly you know forty five years. I've only ever been to one of their talk of their evening talks, and that was the talk that I gave uh, a few few years ago. I, I've never been able to be there at the same time, but since the pandemic, they've moved online, and actually you can join that from anywhere now. It's the same with my, my work in ornithology and ecology. You're able to connect with places and do things now in a way you just couldn't do before. I think that whatever have um, when we have meetings on campus, um, quite often we may attract you know a good audience of twenty or thirty people, or whatnot. We're seeing people coming on there with online meetings now, a hundred and hundred and fifty people coming to these things because they can do it so easily. They don't actually physically have to drive and then drive home on a late night. So I think it's about designing the, our, our our learning experiences. To find out what is what is that people need and where where where's the best way to get it. Um, it isn't about lecturing online and talking at people in a, in a in a in a delivery mode. It's about using the interactiveness of this media to encourage people to actually sh you know share conversations, to play music together. I I, I saw I saw thirty five years ago in Canada. I saw fiddle being taught 
you know, using video conference over a distance there, way before, it was like NASA, it was like space technology stuff, you know, we do that on a day-to-day -day basis now. What we don't do is actually reach out there and take people from wider than the community. So looking at in terms of actually um, uh, economics, people like the, the RSA, for example, or, or, or various other societies, um, who can actually provide, the university can provide the template, the framework, the, the base plate, that people can use that to actually connect with their special areas of interest and have that area of, of richness in their life without having to, to leave or, or, or being un, unable to drive to the nearest city to get that experience, I think. I think we, we have a huge physical human technology and if we match that with our ability to connect with, with, with that, then you can, you can have the best of both worlds, I think. Great, thank you, Frank. Uh, and I think if we turn to Amelia, um, one of the things that, that is part of the question that Lydia has asked is around how do you think UHI could use digital learning to deliver an equivalent learning experience to all students, UHI students, irrespective of place and irrespective of part time, full time attendance? You've experienced some of this, but is there anything you'd like to kind of share in terms of how we might take that further? Um, well, I think, first of all, it, it's a perfect example. We've got a student in Madrid who just joined us for the first year and we've got me in Germany and another friend. And I can honestly say it's been the same experience that I had than any students in Scotland. So really, it is irrespective of place or of mode of attendance. We didn't have to go to the campus and we had we had the same the same experience than other students. And I think really also like opening up the degree internationally, I think will will show others that it is irrespective of place or of mode of attendance. It is possible to join and you will have the same experience as people that are um that are in Scotland, as shown by the virtual residency and all the group projects that are possible from your home. You don't ha actually have to be there. So I think taking that further would really open up Another dimension and would like attract more students, but also make it more more versatile as well. Great, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm conscious that we've got a number of questions that have come in now, um, uh, and I'm also conscious that probably in about five or six minutes' time, I need to start doing some kind of summing up. Um, so um, let's see how far we get. And what I'm going to suggest is that for any questions we don't answer, um, I know that this recording is going to be made available later. So. For any questions that we don't answer, I might put our panel on the spot and just say that um, uh, we might commit to dividing them up and doing a, a short kind of written response, which we can uh, include with the recording if that's okay. Um, but hopefully we'll get to the end of the session and not have too many left. Um, so uh, I'm going to move to the next question. Uh, and uh, this is from Anne Tilbury. What suggestions do the panel members have to recognise and reward staff and students for the contributions to these communities, um, I guess the communities we're in, the communities that were kind of the wider communities were part of. Uh, current recognition and reward strategies for both staff and students are predominantly individually focused and seem to work against the nurturing of communities of learning and teaching. So what I think I'm going to do is ask each panel member um, for their kind of um, uh, the most salient response, the thing that comes to the top of their list uh, in terms of how we might tackle this. So one or two brief uh, examples from each of uh, our um, uh, academic panel members, uh, and we'll see if Amelia would like to say anything on, on the kind of student perspective as well. So I'm just going to go back through the order we started in. So Alison, any one or two immediate thoughts from you on this one? Yeah, thanks, Anne. I think that's a really important point, uh, how, how people are rewarded. I think useful to reflect on what different universities do and how they approach these things. Um, a number of years ago I worked at Glasgow Caledonian University and certainly there was a Caledonian Scholars program where people could apply either as individuals or, or in teams and that very much looked at what their outcomes were, how they engaged with, with communities uh, both around the campus and, and further afield or, or with student communities. So, you know, that's, that's one model. It wasn't only focused on the individual academic. Um, so it's, it's really important to, to think about 
other models that could be implemented and maybe work with, with HR to do that. My, uh, my last role was at, at Glasgow University and uh, Glasgow rewards um, evidence of being collegiate because of course, you know, as academics, we're, we should be working together. So uh, if you wanted to become a professor, for example, you don't just show your publications or research or whatever, but you show how you've contributed um, as part of a wider community. So I think looking at these models is important. Thank you very much, Alison. Um, Frank, uh, what's top of your list in terms of the one or two key things that you think we should consider here? Two key things. Um, the first one I would say from an individual perspective, I would want the, the university as a whole to recognise um, the possibilities of greater flexibility for staff. So you don't have to be a nine to five job, which we know it's not anyway. Um, I'd like to see the ability to actually people work perhaps longer days and, and fewer days um, and, and combination of these things, which establish a flexi time, a flexi, a flexi working pattern that allows people to actually customize that with their own lifestyle and their, and their, their, their need to look after children or to look after aged parents or to do various other things within, within. So I'd like to see greater flexibility and get, getting away from this sort of one size fits all nine to five model when you clock in and clock off, which we know that most staff don't do anyway. So let's, let's recognize that, build on that and reward it. Um, the second one I would give you is even just this week I've been I've been um, sitting the the, the opening um, salvos as it were as Anna Wendy was on my mailing list as well um, to pull together a meeting which uh, tries to find from the three island communities Orkney Shetland and the Western Isles um, how we can actually work together to develop joint research initiatives. Um, that's not to say we're not going to do it within anybody else and other parts of the university, but not. But there are there are definite needs within the island communities there, and I would like to see the university rewarding collegiate effort. So so you get a higher you get a higher scoring for your project if you deliberately involve people from more than one one, one campus or one academic partner. So you deliberately set up that net to, to make it as broad as possible across the university, rather than put the wagons in a circle and do the do, do only the things with people in the same corridor as you. And that, that would actually encourage and force people out to, of the that, that silo mentality into a broader a broader a broader reach. Great. Thank you, Frank. Um uh and I think we're kind of you know, uh some really interesting things there from from both yourself and, and Alison and, and things to think about in terms of um uh our kind of cun academic community, our community of practitioners and how we work even more closely together and collectively taking forward whatever we might coming out of COVID, I think. Um, Anna Wendy, uh, anything you'd like to respond to in relation to Anne's question? Maybe, um, I don't have a lot to add to that other than that I think there's a lot to celebrate, a lot of talent, a lot of achievement within the university to celebrate. And uh, it's been interesting because I've been talking with a um, an university in um, Finland and and they've been very congratulatory about um, the profile and the, the 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 case studies and the marketing and the the the, the effort that goes into celebrating our um, our staff and our output, but I always think there's room for more and to profile um, the the and case studies and celebrate these. I think that it's great that uh, the university has engaged with the National Teaching Fellowship um, scheme and um, that there's opportunity there for teams and individuals to be acknowledged, but teams as well, for instance, in the Collaborative Award for Teaching Excellence. Great, thank you. Uh, and finally, uh... I've lost you. I've lost you. Sorry, my mute button decided to take control of itself. Uh, Amelia, I was just going to move to you and see if there's anything you want to share in relation to um, recognition and reward for students, um, uh, which Anne has also raised, um, uh, and how that might help kind of nurture communities of learning. Um, I can just talk about my own experience, but something I really enjoyed was the, for example, one one project by. Um, 
by Anna Wendy and the team was the US Music Scholarship, where they inv invited someone um, to the islands. And I think this really, first of all, it nurtures other culture. It shows other people what culture US has, but then also it's a kind of two way street because you also have the student who then gets involved in the community and the student will immediately get something back, but also the community will get the student to be involved and, and they can learn something new and something else has been taken back alumni as tutors for um, to come back to these communities. And I think that's really beneficial because it shows students what you what you can do after after the degree. And I think a lot of alumni realize um, what they learned in those years and what what those communities showed them in, in the learning experience. So I think those those are two examples of really beneficial projects. Thank you very much, Amelia. Um, uh, so I'm conscious of time and I'm going to pass back to Jill in a second. Um, uh, what I will do, um, rather than attempt to summarise this really rich discussion today, um, uh, I think uh, I'll, I'll do some work alongside the other panel members. We'll get some written uh, responses to the questions not answered. Uh, and when the link goes online, we will share with it uh, a short kind of summary of today's discussion. But I want to draw attention very briefly to uh, Ellen Greaves' post. Um, uh, uh, and give a, a final word to our student community. Uh, and this, I think, shows uh, the art what's possible. Um, because of my remote experience in applied music as a student, I've been able to use the transferable skills to assist the NHS vaccine programme to overcome initial remote communication problems. I've also joined a music group in the Borders from Orkney. Using these skills during lockdown too, she has managed to teach uh, music students remotely. Um, so I think that is a, a nice way to um, uh, end our discussion today because it brings together the digital, uh, the connectivity, the skills we can develop, uh, and also the transferability of the skills and knowledge that we develop in digitally distribute, distributed learning and teaching contexts. So, uh, final word uh, to Ellen there, and Jill, I'll pass back to you. Um, and just to say thank you very much to all our panel members for today. I believe Joe's going to come back in. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so just to say um, thank you very much to everybody that's spoken today. Really interesting, some good questions and answers. Um, really enjoyed it myself because it's although I work in the university quite often, I don't hear all this fantastic work that's going on because my head's buried in in our very um, focused uh, area. So I just wanted to invite everybody that's here today to the next event. Uh, this is Leading Health Research and Innovation, and it's on the 10th of June at four o'clock. And we've got an interesting lineup, some people talking about uh, uh, digital health, talking about um, interventions to help people get moving, and especially, especially when we've all spent so much time sat at our desks over these last few months. I think we're probably all in danger of needing a little bit of that. Um, and talking about Inverness campus and uh, all the uh, exciting developments that are happening there. So, Keith, I'll hand back to you just to wrap up, if that's OK. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jill. And thank you for um, organising and overseeing um, not just our event, but the, the programme of uh, these events. Uh, thanks once again to all our um, panel speakers, um, internal and external, and for everyone that took time to come along and post a question. Uh, we'll lace with Jill to make sure that uh, any unanswered questions um, will be covered in the, the little write-up we'll do to accompany the link. Uh, and uh, that was bang on time. So rather than keep people beyond expected time, we'll just say thank you and uh, conclude there. So thanks everyone.